Chapter 5. Mission Elapsed Time The wind whipped across the craggy, desolate landscape. Ardo could almost feel the grains of sand digging into the joints of his powered combat suit. There was no help for it. The squad was at attention. If he even contemplated making a move, Ardo felt sure that Lieutenant Brian would make sure it was his last. Even though the combat suit carefully controlled his body temperature to keep it at peak performance, he had felt a rivulet of sweat start to make its way between his shoulder blades toward the hollow of his back. Maybe Sergeant Littlefield was right. Maybe something was still scrambled in his head after his re back at the starport. He was having a little trouble concentrating, and there was a sense of foreboding that seemed to hover just at the edge of his conscious thought. His father had often called such notions the promptings of the spirit, that still, small voice that came to men to give them divine direction. Heed that voice, his father had said, and it will never lead you wrong. Where was that warning spirit when the Zerg had torn his parents apart limb from limb? A sharp, blinding pain fought through the back of his right eye. Ardo winced as the wave of nausea followed. The image of spraying his breakfast hash across his battlesuit visor flitted across his mind. Littlefield said it would pass, Ardo thought, as he struggled to regain his mental balance. Just hang on for a moment and it will be all right. He tried, instead, to concentrate on Lieutenant Brienne. She stood before them, the polarized feel of her bubble helmet deliberately turned down so that everyone could see her face clearly as she spoke. Everyone in the squad faced rigidly forward. No one wanted to risk catching her eye as she strode before them. With everyone pulling out, they're sending us in, my beauties. Her voice sounded before them, only slightly distorted by the helmet she wore. Oral directional enhancers in the suits made both transmitted and external sounds seem to come from the direction of their source. The entire Confederacy force is jumping off the surface of this rock, but what of the colonists? Ardo thought. Is the Confederacy leaving them here as well? Before we join our brothers in abandoning this dustbowl of a planet, we've got a job to do. Burning to burn them, ma'am. Cutter interrupted enthusiastically in a crisp military voice. Brienne smiled like a wolf in response. You'll have plenty to roast with that toy of yours before we finished, Mr. Kura Abi. I would suggest, however, that we get the job done first and get off this rock while we still have a way out. Ma'am, yes ma'am. Cutter sounded a little disappointed. Your new home, if any of you are wondering, is Bunker Complex 3847. A week ago, it was an outpost settlement. Folks used, it, used to call it Senec. God knows why. It's all ours now. Enjoy it while you can, cause I don't intend to stay here one moment more than we have to for this mission. There's an old pumping settlement at the bottom of an impact crater just northeast of here. It's a collection of scrap metal called Oasis, about three clicks out, on a radial of 35 degrees from the command transmitter. Set your navigational transceivers to those coordinates. Captain Mars here. The pilot stood squinting in the blowing dust, managing to wave his hand slightly in reluctant identification. We'll be flying cover and directing us below. Flying cover? It was Sejak, the young kid. In a dropship? The Vixen has been fitted with a special receiver, Mr. Sejak. To help us locate the thing we are looking for. Do you have a problem with this, mister? The tone in her voice should have frosted over Sejak's faceplate from the inside. No, ma'am. We find this thing, we pull out and bring it with us. Clean and quick. Corporal Smith Poon will lead first squad on vultures with Bowers, Fu, Peaches and Wyndham. Littlefield? Yes, ma'am. The old marine's voice sounded loud in Ardo's helmet. Littlefield was standing right next to him. You take second squad. That will be Ali, Bernelli, Melnikov and Siang. Cutter and Eckhart will give you heavy support in the firebats. Ardo took in the names of his squad as best he could. Bernelli, Jiang and Eckhart were unfamiliar to him. Cutter was still a very dangerous mystery. If they needed a squad leader, though, Littlefield gave him a little more hope that he might have had otherwise. Ma'am, yes, ma'am, Littlefield barked back enthusiastically. Brienne barely took notice. Jensen, you're boss of the third squad. That's Colin, Malish, Essen, and Mbutu. Wabowski gives you firebat support. Yes, ma'am, Jensen replied without much enthusiasm. Ardo hoped the man fought better than he talked. He looked as though he were about to fall asleep where he stood. The dropship will fly high cover and sense our support until we've got the prize. Then we dust off and get off this rock. Any questions? 
When Brian said it, it was a dare, not an invitation. Ardo could not help himself. He stepped forward and saluted as he spoke. Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Molkov, isn't it? Melnikov, ma'am. Begging your pardon, ma'am. What's your question, Melnikov? What are we looking for, ma'am? Lieutenant Brian looked away from him, her eyes focusing into the distance. A box, private. Just a box. Ardo felt wonderful. He loved running in the power armor. It seemed effortless as he bounded across the ground. The clicks rolled under him, the salmon-colored dust trailing behind him and his companions. He switched the visor of his battlesuit to navigation mode. Wherever he looked, the visor superimposed a map of their surrounding terrain and labels of the more prominent landmarks. Despite what the lieutenant had said, Senik had been aptly named. The settlement's primary job had been to maintain the upper pumping station for the aqueduct pipes coming out of Oasis. As such, it was situated on the sheer drop-off that marked the edge of the basin, the remains of a major impact crater that had gouged a magnificent long bowl out of the surface. The remains of the crater rim had eroded somewhat over time. His visor labeled the razor peaks to his left as stone wall, and the embarrassingly appropriate peak to his left as Molly's nipple. The crater itself was a barren landscape, like so much of the entire world of Mars Sara, but there was a stark beauty in its ruggedness that pleased Ardo's eye. A road snaked its way in switchbacks down the steep incline of the crater edge. Ardo smiled again at the thought of the local civis slowly winding their tortured way down the treacherous road before reaching the valley floor. The marines were not constrained by such weakness. His entire squad had bounded over the steep edge of the mesa and had galloped straight down to the crater floor. The battle suits were designed to take a lot more punishment than a little tumble down a cliff face, and the marines inside them were, he thought smartly, tougher than the suits they wore. Hubris, it was his father's voice. Pride cometh before a fall. Ardo frowned. His headache threatened suddenly to return. Better not to think about it and concentrate on his job. First squad floated off to his squad's right on their four hover cycles. Normally, mobile units in siege tanks or even a pair of Goliath walkers would supplement the platoon. Ardo rather thought that first squad had arrived hoping for such heavy equipment. They were destined for disappointment, being issued local vulture hover bikes that had been recently liberated from the local militia. They were fast, light and highly maneuverable, and they gave their right about as much protection as a paper hat. The squad leader, a corporal named Smith Poon, was having some difficulty holding back the cycles to stay even with the two other marine squads beating feet across the floor of the crater. Third squad was running flank off to his left while Ardo's own second squad was taking point for the group. They all ran in a line, the slope of the crater floor gradually flattening out. Above them all, the Valkyrie Vixen howled, her downward angle jets churning a wall of dust behind the platoon zone. Lieutenant Brian ran slightly behind third squad. That was surprising, Ardo had expected the lieutenant to stay aloft in the dropship and run the entire show from up there. He had served under other commanders who preferred the backseat drive their platoons from a pleasantly remote location. His own estimation of Brienne went up several points. The ground shook underfoot with each stride Ardo made. The oxygen in the suit poured into him, making him feel alive, ready and anxious to do his duty for the Confederacy. We are tough, Ardo thought. Everyone says so although he could not recall just who had said it or where he had heard it ever really said. All he knew was that the outskirts of Oasis were coming up fast before him and he would finally be able to exact justice for what the Zerg had done to him.